Hey everybody, Jason Rothman here, Corona Clicks number 24. Thank you for joining me here this evening. 24 days into Corona Clicks where every day we're doing a video, a podcast about Google ads and business during this time of Corona. Look at it the other way, Corona during times of Google ads and business. And I'm going to keep doing this uh, every day until we break the curve in the United States or until we get some really good news with some medicine. So, um, 24 days in first, let's just talk a little business. Um, I saw an, a Ben Carson, Dr. Ben Carson interview last night, and he said something extremely smart. I'm going to say the smartest thing I've ever heard Ben Carson say, or something like that. And, um, I think he's a very smart gentleman, uh, board member at Costco, I believe, uh, may not be still cause he's in government, uh, but he was now he's in government. And of course he had a great career as a, as a surgeon, I think, or a physician surgeon. So very wise person, very calm person. And I respect that a lot about him. Um, I heard him say something so interesting yesterday. He was talking about, um, I'm pretty sure he was talking about hydroxychloroquine, and he, he said he always asked himself four questions whenever he has a decision. And I might be getting the wording slightly wrong, but I think I have the spirit of what he's asking himself uh, correct. And it's, it's kind of the way I think as well in terms of looking at the two extreme ends of a possible decision and then looking at the likelihood of where you think uh, something is going to go. So... He said when he has a decision like, should a doctor prescribe the hydroxychloroquine? Or at least that kind of discussion. He said, he asked himself, if he does it, what's the best outcome? If he does it, what's the worst outcome? If he doesn't do it, what's the best outcome? And if he does, doesn't do it, what's the worst outcome? So he's basically asking himself, if I do this, what's the best and worst thing that can happen? If I don't do this, what's the best and worst thing that can happen? And then he said that helps him guide his decision making. And to me, that's very clear. That's very rational thinking. And um, I do a version of that, kind of looking at worst case and best case scenarios. Uh, but I also, I also like the way he breaks it down into four different questions. And there's two halves to it. If I do this, if I don't do this. And then the two sides of the halves, best and worst outcomes. I like that. I like that for a few reasons. One, he does the same best and worst thing that I like to do. Um, but I also like it because he takes a minute and he stops and he thinks. And I, I try to do that as much as possible. I, I'm i a decision maker. I'm a decider, as someone once said. And I make a lot of decisions and they, they impact a lot of situations. And I'm always, I, I don't want to always follow this, but I'm always trying to remind myself that all options are on the table despite social norms, despite um, human faulty thinking that I have to deal with as well, and despite people's expectations and my own expectations. I'm always trying to remind myself that all options are on the table. Um, that helps me make decisions, that helps me slow down and think about think about answers to different situations, problems to different, or solutions to different problems that wouldn't maybe be the first thing or first few things that I think about. I also got this from a great poker player, Tom Dwan. One time I, I saw an interview or something and he was talking about how when, when he gets dealt a hand and then has a decision to make at a decision in poker. I may be, let me see if I can say this right. He said, there's always three things you can do. You can raise, you can call, or you can fold. And I guess raise could also mean bet, uh, cause you raise it from nothing to a bet. But just hearing him talk about that, that, Hey, when you have your, your hand, and you're in a position and you have to make a decision, you're at a decision-making point, no matter how common it is for people to check in certain positions, no matter how common it is for people to raise or bet, or how common it is for people to fold in certain positions, 
all options are always on the table. And so that's why he's a he's a unique skill in that area because he's just thinking differently than other people and where a lot of people might be on autopilot in situations where they would normally fold, he at least goes through the process of, I have three options. I can raise, I can call, or I can fold. And he at least goes through those options instead of just being on autopilot. Another quote comes to mind, Warren Buffett, don't sleepwalk through life, think. And so that's that's why I like uh, this, this uh, thought process by Ben Carson. I can either do this or I don't have to do this. I have the option. So no matter what the social norms are, no matter what people's expectations are, no matter what my own expectations are, commitment bias where maybe publicly I said I would do something and then I may think not to do it, well, I'm fighting against that bias now as well. So I like the way he thinks and always puts all options on the table. And it's so easy to get stuck on autopilot. And if you study persuasion and thinking, our brains are maybe meant to be on autopilot because we, evolution-wise, we were faced with so many life and death decisions that all the easy decisions we had to put on autopilot because we had so many important other decisions to focus on. So our brains are very wired for patterns and autopilot. And if you see this over and over and over in this situation, and you start doing this over and over and over, then you'll always do that in that situation without thinking. But I want to be a thinker. I want to find my edges. I want to find my opportunities in life and in business. And to do that, you have to think. So I really like what Ben Carson said. Ask yourself, if I do this, just first know you have the option. You can do it or you don't have to do it. But if you do it, what's the best outcome? If you don't do it, or excuse me, if you do it, what's the best outcome? If you do it, what's the worst outcome? If you don't do it, what's the best outcome? If you don't do it, what's the worst outcome? And in a Google Ads perspective, that might be meaning taking on a certain client that comes your way, a certain opportunity. Maybe they're not your perfect situation, but maybe it's a big money situation. There's a lot of opportunity there, and you're willing to bend some of your normal uh, rules in terms of clients you like to work with. So let's run through that scenario. Say I get a big client, looks like a potential big opportunity. Maybe they're spending $10,000 a month, but maybe that's a test budget and they'll actually spend $70,000 a month. And let's say they're maybe look a little hard, a little more difficult to work with than I would prefer. Maybe they're in an industry that's not my favorite, but there is a lot of money on the table. So If I do this, what's the best outcome? The best outcome is I get paid based off $70,000 spend and I keep that client for decades and that client refers me to other big spend clients and it's the money I'll make from that client's more than all the other money I've made in any endeavor in my life and I ride off into the sunset. So that's the best outcome if I do it. How likely is that? I don't know, but that's the best outcome. If I've got a big talking $10,000 a month client coming my way, and it could be a lot more. If I do this, what's the worst outcome? Well, the worst outcome would be uh, they don't grow their budget more than $10,000. They were talking up $10,000. They actually spend $7,000 a month. Uh, They're a horrible person to work with. They bring on stress. It'll never be long-term because they're not a good advertiser. They don't know how to think and perform in the Google ad space and they're horrible. They treat their people horrible and I'm one of their people that they're going to treat horrible and it's going to be stressful. Uh, but, but I'm my own person and I can do what I want and I don't have to work for anybody and I can fire them after a couple months of nonsense and I can go separate ways, be professional about it, but say, Hey, this just isn't working out for me. And it sounds like the worst outcome is I'm going to have possibly eight weeks of stress before I figure out that they're just not a good client for me. We part ways. Maybe they say some not so nice words, but that's the worst that can happen. And that's not that bad. If I don't do this, what's the best outcome? Looking at it different. If I don't do this, I the best outcome is I miss, I good in a, in a good way miss out on a couple months of stress. I missed out on some acrimonious conversations and I miss out on stress basically for for two months and that's the best outcome if I don't do this what's the worst outcome 
Well, that would be that I miss out on a once in a lifetime opportunity to make once in a lifetime money. Uh, again, that client would grow their spend, that client would recommend me to other people, and that client would be my client for decades. That's a pretty bad worst outcome, but that's the worst outcome. And they're kind of inverse ways of looking at things, but running through that thought process there, it's a no-brainer to to bend my kind of new client rules and work with the client, work with someone who might be a jerk, work with someone who is in an industry I'm not the biggest fan of working in, because I've looked at my best outcomes, I've looked at my worst outcomes, the best outcomes are life-changing, uh, potentially, and the worst outcomes are not that bad. Eight weeks of stress, I can take that, and a few acrimonious conversations Hey, nothing new for me. So uh, it's not that bad. So going through that process, it would it would help judge what I want to do. Now, if that client was spending $4,000 a month and it didn't look like there was any room to grow, maybe I run through that scenario, scenario of thinking and I go, yeah, yeah, that's not worth it at all. My best outcome is they spend $4,000 a month and refer me to a few people. Um, and I have a good solid client for the long run, but nothing life changing. And the worst outcome is I get a ton of stress and it's eight weeks of stress and it's horrible. And when I look at that risk versus reward, that's not worth it because I'm not going to trade eight weeks of stress in a couple acrimonious conversations, uh, just for your average run of the mill, uh, revenue. So great thought process from Dr. Ben Carson and, as uh, my guy Monish Pabra likes to say, be a shameless cloner. That's how I go through life. Not only am I a cloner, I'm a shameless cloner. I'm going to clone the way Dr. Carson thinks and um, hopefully be successful as well. So wanted to uh, run through that business idea. Now let's talk a little COVID-19. Let's talk a little coronavirus. So today in Oklahoma City, it was like 80 or 82 degrees. It was sunny. Um, I did the old man new balance thing. I was wearing a collared shirt. I was wearing normal kind of khakis, work attire, but instead of wearing brown Oxfords, I wore new balance sneakers, old running shoes. And there's just some combination about that. That's so freeing. And that's why old men do it because up top, you're serious, you're professional, you're thinking like a businessman. Down on the bottom, New Balance, running shoes, S hits the fan, you're ready to bolt. And there's just something free about moving around in New Balances while you're uh, in regular work attire. So felt good, 80, 82 degrees, feel strong, feel rested, getting business stuff done, getting on top of everything, and um, things are good business-wise. And on top of that, I'll just be honest. I'm getting I'm getting a buzz off this UFC UFC uh, two nineteen or two forty nine whatever it is. Um, I think it's maybe two forty nine. They're going to do it on an Indian reservation, Indian land in California, and they're just not stopping. They're just going to bend the rules, follow the rules, get on Indian land, do what they need to do, and put a card on. And great fights, and I love watching the UFC fights, MMA fights, and. I have live sports to look forward to. So I'm watching that saga kind of play out. Having a freaking good old time today. And it was like that moment in the desert where you see the mirage of water and you go, oh, let me just keep walking. Let me keep walking. Let me keep walking. It's right. It's right there. I can see it. That's what I was like with coronavirus. I was, I felt like it was gone. I felt like the cloud was lifted. It, again, it was 80, 82 degrees. It was a beautiful day. The sun, I was soaking it in. I had energy. And I just felt like going out into the world. I was like, oh, I could go to a restaurant right now. Oh, I could go for a walk, go to this place, go to that place. I just, And, of course, I can go for a walk normally during all this kind of uh, stay-at-home stuff. But still, I felt like the cloud was gone. And it just felt good to have that feeling back. And then it faded. Um and we're back in this. But you know what? It was kind of like that mirage moment in the desert. I was like, I, I can feel it. I can see it. And it felt good. And when we're back to it, trust me, it'll feel good. Um, but I got to be honest with you. Uh, I'm seeing, I'm, I'm feeling acrimony coming down, down our path here. Because I'm feeling a splitting 
of our country. I'm feeling our old partisan fracturing come up again. I'm feeling a split between medicine and science and all those beautiful words, along with other beautiful words, civil liberties and freedom and living your life. And I'm feeling a split. That's just what, that's just the patterns I'm seeing. And I don't know what we're going to do here. And we're, we're April 7th. We've all kind of signed up. Hey, you're sending us money. Hey, we're following the social distancing. Like, hey, we understand we got to flatten the curve as a, as a society. And we're going we're gonna to shut it down for a month. We get it. And we've got some good news out of New York. Good news out of, uh, I think, New Jersey. Definitely good news out of California, Washington. I believe the hospital bed usage is lower than the estimates were. And I believe that the growth rate in terms of people going to the hospital in in New York City is is going down. The growth rate is going down. So maybe still growing, but the growth rate is going down. So it just, we're getting some positive signs. um, And also from different places of the world as well. But here's my question. And again, I would be the best White House press room briefing reporter ever because I was asked questions that we could all use. Um, what, like, what I, my question to the president, my question to Dr. Fauci would be, fellas, we understand social distancing. We understand break the curve, bend the curve, 30 days to stop the curve, all that kind of stuff. We're doing it. We're washing our hands, trying not to touch our face. Social social distancing, uh, staying at home, only going out for necessities. A lot of people are wearing masks. All that's going on. We're doing it. So let's 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 paint a little picture here, fellas. Let's get to. Let's not even talk about April thirtieth. Let's just say we're into late May, and that curve has broken. And whenever that day comes, whether it's May or June or even later, and in the United States of America, there is not one new coronavirus test positive, and there is not one new coronavirus death. One day we'll get there when there's nothing new. And we have totally bent the curve and flatlined the curve. What happens then? Fellas, what happens then? Are we all allowed to go back to school, go back to work? Are we all allowed to pack stadiums again? Concerts and sporting events and all that kind of stuff? Are we allowed to be in the streets, streets of densely populated cities, mass transportation, all that kind of stuff? Do we just flip that switch on? And if we do, if we're able to get back to normal and get back to our economy the way it was, what happens to the novel coronavirus COVID-19? What, what happens? Do, do people who hadn't gotten it yet get it and then the healthy people spread to the unhealthy people again and then our hospitals potentially are, are overwhelmed again? What happens? Does the curve then inflate again and we have to do this again? What happens? Now, that would be my question. That's what I need to know. That's what I think the country needs to know to to stop us from stop us from this uh, fracturing that's going on that I think is coming because people need guidance. They need certainty. They need hope. But more than anything, I think they need certainty. We need a plan. And we need to know that if we put in this work, in April, possibly in May, of staying at home, social distancing. What's our payoff? When do we get out of this? And what does getting out of this look like? It would be nice to get some clarity in that department. And one thing that gives me kind of um, a, a somewhat of a picture is yesterday they were talking about people taking some kind of antibody test and they're going to distribute tens of millions of those per month. And people can take a test, find out if they have the antibodies, find out if they've already had coronavirus, possibly as I understand it, which means I think they would be immune to coronavirus going forward, immune to catching it, immune to spreading it. 
And that would give people the confidence to go back into complete normal life. Because if everybody out there has the antibodies and they can't catch it and they can't spread it, then the whole vaccine thing, of course, we want the vaccine, but it doesn't matter in the sense that no one's going to get it. But of course, that's not going to happen just overnight. And so we're getting the vaccine and um, we're probably not going to most likely, totally not likely, we're going to wake up in uh, in late May and just everyone's going to have the antibodies and say, oh, this thing's over. That's, of course, probably not likely. But how many people are going to have the antibodies? Are we going to have immunity free zones or immune zones where like you go into a restaurant and you flash your wristband showing that you have the antibodies. How's that going to work? Um, I'm not a scientist. I'm not a, I'm not a doctor. I'm not a politician. I don't know. I don't know what they know, but I want to know what they know. So what's going to happen? What does April 30th look like? What does sometime in May or later when the curve is totally flat look like? How do we get back in the mix here? So that'd be my question. Um, and that's those are kind of my COVID-19 thoughts today. I'm excited for the UFC. I'm hopeful on hydroxychloroquine. I'm worried about a fracturing coming about where people are just, they're just like, uh, like let's go. We got to go. We got we to gotta live our lives here. I'm just worried about that moment where people kind of get fed up. Um, I don't know when that is. I don't know what will happen then, but I'm worried. Um, but then again, I'm hopeful with the antibodies. And then again, I'm hopeful that if we can get a plan uh, from the people in charge, get some certainty on, on what the comeback looks like, uh, we can all look forward to the comeback and, and continue to uh, all be in this together. So those are my COVID-19 thoughts for today. Had a little taste of uh, pre-COVID today with the sun. It felt so good. But uh, but we're in it. It's April 7th. Uh, as you listen to this, it'll probably be April 8th. Moving forward, moving through April. Every day there's good news. Less people going to the hospital than they expect. Um, and uh, the whole world, the smartest people in the world, they're all working on vaccines. They're, they're all working on medicines. And there is still a very strong we're all in it together. And, um, that's where we are. So let's get through this and, uh, let's get back to business. So thanks for watching everybody. Uh, thanks for listening. The Rothman PPC podcast is now on Apple podcast. I think it's on Google podcast as well. Look it up, just search Rothman PPC and you can subscribe there if you prefer this on, um, on audio. So good luck out there everyone. And I'll see you tomorrow.